Welcome everybody, my name is Cyberslat. Now, I know you're more used to wanting to buy gold, but today I thought I could get you to invest in something a little bit different. So, BlizzCon is just behind us, and with that we witnessed some of the most incredible Mythic Plus performances we've ever seen. I hope that inspired a lot of you to get interested in it yourself, and maybe try and push further than you've ever pushed before, especially with the new season on the horizon. And luckily, I'm here to help. Over the next few months, I'll be bringing you a series of videos all poised at how you can improve at Mythic Plus, setting you up with the fundamentals to eventually push towards the forefront of Mythic Plus, the cusp of the MDI. Today, however, I wanted to just start us all off on the same page, you know, clean slate, and just take a closer look at the current state of Mythic Plus. That way we can kind of understand what's going on. Um, and you'll have noticed, meanwhile in this video, we've been watching a clip of a current uh, or of a, a recent Mythic Plus dungeon from the MDI. So let's just take a closer look at what's going on and what you can expect along your lonely road of pugging. Join me, my friends. Okay, so we're going to be taking a look at an Atoll Dazar 18. Um, the affixes are bolstering, grievous, fortified with the emissaries. Um, there's also the option for reaping, but uh, this one's got emissaries in. Fun. Um, I do want you to keep an eye on the video that's displaying whilst I am talking, uh, because there's going to be a pop quiz at the end. And I want to make sure you all have the correct answers. No, um, in all seriousness, there's going to be things that I'm talking about kind of after the fact. So just make sure you're keeping an eye on the video so that when I'm discussing it, you kind of, ah, oh, yeah, I remember seeing that. Might be helpful. The first thing I wanted to discuss here is the difference in composition between the two teams. I know what you're thinking. They're pretty much exactly the same. And they basically are. However, there's one key difference. This DK that's in uh, the group Buff Warrior. Now... You may think it's a subtle difference, however, they're basing their whole composition and the whole run of the dungeon around this DK. Um, the DK's cooldowns, when they're going to be accessible, um, you know, the pulls that they can do in order to allow this DK to do as much AoE and single target as possible. Because all of this DPS that the DK is able to do in AoE, they're also able to pump a lot of uh, damage into a single target. So the DK is very fundamental here, and you'll see with these pulls that they're doing, these doing the, these incredible snapshots, you know, um, with the rogue. Um, that, by the way, the snapshot is literally just the rogue tricks of the trading. They run up, they pull the mobs, boom, they instantly jump to the to the tank there because the tank's put himself in a position um, of, of inaccessibility. So the ads kind of just, I don't know, it's a weird bug that Blizzard for some reason allows. And hey, you know what, power to him because it allows me to get my keys down in time. Um, so what is the warrior bringing, the warrior tank bringing to each group? I know a lot of you probably do Mythic Plus now and are thinking, well, hold on, I thought, you know, Monk are the best tank. How come they're all playing warrior in the MDI? The reason being, you know, in, in live, people are doing 22s, 23s, 24s, and, you know, etc. And Monk is uh, far and away the better tank for survivability, which is what's required in these kinds of dungeons. Whereas warrior tank provides very high DPS. Um, you know, incredible DPS, as well as the warrior buff of the, of the attack power buff. So for these 18, you know, they're, they're doing baby keys. These 18 keys, they're warm-ups, and, you know, they're speed clearing them in 10 minutes because they just have this incredible DPS output via this warrior tank, which is which is helping. And again, with the Resto Druid that both groups are bringing, Resto Druids do incredible DPS as well, whilst also bringing a battle res, whilst also bringing, you know, incredible healing, um, Typhoon, Vortex, Entangling Roots, Hibernate, which you'll see made, uh, made use of here in this video as well later in, in the dungeon. Um, Resto Druids are very, very strong right now. Very, very strong. Um, the Monk is obviously bringing, uh, you know, another damage buff, which is great. A uh, very good utility in terms of an AoE stun. Um, it's very speedy. It can be used to, you know, um, uh, reset bosses or whatever if there are mistakes. And there are cute little things that you can do with the Monk, which is really, really nice. Um, now the rogues are obviously a core component. You don't really see Mythic Plus without a rogue, and the reason for that is they have so much uh, in their toolkit, from shroud to cheat death. You know, if somebody makes a boo boo, um, they've got incredible defenses as well with cloak. Um, they've got uh, sap. They've got tricks of the trade. They've got uh, what haven't they got? You know what? I'm gonna stop. I've run out of fingers. I've run out of fingers for rogue. I've just They've got everything, okay? Imagine the best thing in the world. It's it, it's it's an outlaw rogue. It's an outlaw rogue, I can tell you that. However, outlaw rogue does suffer from somewhat low DPS, specifically for a prior target, which is why buff warrior is gonna ultimately end up winning the series. Um, they they just have this higher output with 
the DK on their single target, which Outlaws and, and Monk just really can't can't provide. Buff Monk, by the way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the composition there. Now, also, both groups, you'll notice, are Night Elf um, in their entirety. The reason for this is Shadow Meld is very, very good in this dungeon for these quick skips where they don't have to employ a... You know, there's no point for that second Rogue Shroud that you get with Team D because they have this, this Shadow Meld potential, um, which is really, really nice, especially if any mistakes occur. So if any of you play League of Legends, you'll know that game is all about jungle difference. Well, in Mythic Plus, it's all about root difference, okay? You'll notice here that the two teams are taking very different routes, and ultimately, I think it comes down to the DK and this flawless root from uh, from Buff Warrior that just ends up being, an, uh, you know, an incredible display of, of, of rooting in this dungeon. Team D is probably using a root, uh, a root from like six months ago. It's a very old root. Um, it's a very standard route, and it's it's it'll get your dungeon done, but it's not exactly a speed clear kind of route. Uh, they they end up especially in a bolstering week. They end up going the the route where you have these honor guards that you don't want to kill. You know you need you want to you don't want to kill the totem first because then the honor guard will be um, empowered. But you also don't want to kill everything else first because it will buff the honor guard. And it's a very awkward kind of way of doing that dungeon. Whereas a buff warrior end up doing these incredible pulls with this bolstering. Um, it doesn't matter because the DK is just obliterating everything. And it ends up being very, very efficient. You'll even notice that Team D, when they get to the bridge, um, they end up killing the Void Emissary, which is very slow, because the Void Emissary is a stationary mob. You can't move with it. You can't do anything with it. It's a DPS soak. You have to pump a lot of cooldowns into it to, to kill it, and it's not worth a whole lot of percent. Whereas instead, you'll notice that Buff Warrior, you know, they're doing this Razan skip where they're jumping down just after the after the first boss, after Priestess, and they're managing to skip a lot of that, that just that nuisance emissary pack. So, so far, we've discussed two aspects of this dungeon that Buff Warrior have done very, very well. Their composition, as well as their routing, right? Now, a third thing is just their overall comfortability, it seems to be, that uh, the way that they're playing with one another. You can see the markers that they're using in order to allow for their interrupt rotations. Um, well, that will probably become more apparent a little bit later into the video. Um, but they managed to mark mobs to allow for, you know, concrete interrupts here. There's no mistakes. Everyone knows what target they're supposed to be marking. Um, as well, you'll see that Team D, you know, they have an early wipe in the dungeon. They don't quite recover from it. Um, you, you'll notice if you, if you actually go back and look closely that the the monk ends up moving out from the group Which puts him at risk of being charged by one of the mobs. He then gets killed It then means that he's not there to interrupt which means that a cast gets off which means that everyone else You know the bond zombie mantle gets cast so that everybody, you know no, None of the mobs could be interrupted so you end up in this position where you know the the group kind of just falls apart, they end up wiping, which means that they then don't have any cooldowns when they have to go and repeat the pack. And it ends up just being this miserable kind of uh, slow death, if you will, um, from Team D, which is quite unfortunate. So really just this this comfortability that they're having in playing with, with one another and the communication and the coordination they're having in this key is a big, big factor and will ultimately be, you know, I've done Shrine of the Storms you know, in a, in a 19, in a 20, where you get to the last boss and the whole dungeon's been flawless, you got 10 minutes on that last boss, and then the whole group ruins an interrupt rotation and you wipe and you think, how have you gotten this far? How have you gotten this far? And by now I know it's easy to look at this video and go, right, well, Buff Warrior, clearly just incredible players and they've done this flawlessly and, you know, who can't they be, right? And and it's a, it's a easy thing to, to think that and to look at it that way. Um, but they haven't gone through this run without mistakes. You know, they've had some very clear mistakes, which really just shouldn't have happened. But, um, you know, things can go wrong. But it's it's about how they've recovered from this. You know, you'll notice by the end of the dungeon, both teams have similar death count. But it's just Buff Warrior have, able, have been able to just kind of jump back into it. And, you know, it's been less punishing deaths. It's been at less awkward times. So it's not, you know, it's not been as critical. Um... You know, you'll notice that they've even messed up this little Salrod buffing um, snapshot that they're trying to do here with these little mobs. But it doesn't, it's not that critical. You know, if you wipe on this pack, you're not bloodlusting, you haven't bust cooldowns, you haven't, you, you know, you're right next to the respawn zone. So you're, you're in a comfortable position. And just based on fact how well they're doing the rest of the dungeon, it means that when these mistakes occur, they're not as important. I'd say the most important criteria when you really break Mythic Plus down to its fundamentals is key routing and correct routing. 
Each week it can change depending on what affix combination is, what dungeon it is. It can differ, but I think the more you learn the dungeon, the more you'll get used to, you know, a good route. Um, it can be really key because, you know, you might say, oh, well, I'm only doing a 10 key, you know, who cares? We'll just kind of, you know, put the key in and see what happens. And I think that's a fair point, but if you have the difference between having to push a 10 key and then one chesting it and doing the 11 and then the 12 and then the 13, or if you can two chest or even three chest that 10 key with a good route and, you know, good execution, and you can end up getting that 13 key straight away, you've just saved a lot of time, a lot of potential, you know, heartache and, and pain. Um, and then, you know, if you two chest that, boom, you're into the 15. In two keys, you can, you know, dramatically up your up your key success rate. So I think a good route is always important. Um, now the next thing, which I think is a more delicate issue, would be number two is your group composition. And I think this is, it's a very funny one. I mean, I play a Feral Druid, right? Now, my stream will tell you, I get more tilted than anyone whenever I see in a plus six key, monk, tank, resto, druid, you know, rogue and demon hunter, like get out of here, you know, who are you kidding? I think it's important to have a good composition, but it's also important to understand what key you're doing and what is a, a necessity compared to what would be nice to have. Um, you know, any class in the game, Blizzard aren't that bad at game design, okay? They're kind of good at it, right? They're kind of good at it. Uh, every single class, every single spec in this game can do a 20 key, without doubt. They, in fact, they can do every single 20 key. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, because I, I you know, I know rep hardens, I play a Feral Druid, I know survivals that are doing 20 keys out there. It's not that difficult, okay? The, the problem is, I think a lot of groups, they blame their failures on, you know, oh, if we'd had a rogue, we would have done this. If we had a demon hunter, we would have done this key. And I think it's fair to have that, as, uh, you know, that point of view. But I think you need to look beyond that and think, bring the player, not the spec. I think that's also an important thing. You know, when you're in the MDI and you're doing these kinds of pulls, I think, yeah, this composition is a necessity for, you know, how they're trying to speed clear these runs. But if you're just trying to get your key done, I don't think you need to focus so heavily on this meta build. You know, I think I think we can do away with this, you know, required meta. Because the meta is meta for a reason, right? The meta is for the MDI. And you're not in the MDI, and neither am I, and neither is anyone else you're going to play with. So I think until you're in the MDI, just kind of play with some people, you know, find a comfortability, find what you, you know, find specs that you think um, you like playing with, what, what you found to be helpful. Players, specific players, you might, you know, you might find a... An enhancement shaman who's just really really you know cool dude um always you know really hot on their utility and you find that actually they manage to outperform a lot of the of the meta specs or something so i think it's just important to kind of have a good time with it try and find a, a, a group of friends that you can play with and um and just try and push together you know i think that's a good good point on the composition the third point is group coordination group coordination and uh and uh i guess confidence in, in each other. Uh, you know, you need to be able to trust in your teammates and your teammates need to be able to trust in you. Um, I think being able to just coordinate, you know, all right, who's, you know, before you put the key in, who's interrupting um, X? Who's interrupting Skull? Um, you know, when do you, when you, when do you want Trent's, you know, from the Balanced Druid? When do you want uh, in tank? Do you want all of the Tide Emissaries rooted or do you just want some of them? You know, um, it's important to kind of get that and you can kind of spec that out with the group before you put the key in. You know, use this incredible tool, Method Dungeon Tools. Um, it's a really, really good add-on, which will just allow you to plan a route. You can select specific groups. Oh, you know, what should we do with group 20? What should we do with group 40 and stuff? And and you'll be able to coordinate with your group before you've, you've even put that key in. So you kind of already in your head know how you're gonna work through the dungeon methodically. Um, so I think those are probably the really big, um, important points. I'd say maybe if we're gonna throw in a number four, I would maybe say just have good recovery. You know, if you make a mistake, don't let it eat you up. Don't flame. If you're gonna flame, save your flame for the end of the dungeon. You know, I, I would always kind of uh, put that forth. If you're gonna flame, 
Save it for after the key, all right? Go for it, but save it for after the key. Just get through the dungeon, try and recover from the mistakes, and just move on. Now, you're going to see in this key, they're pretty much about to wrap it up. Um, you know, Buff Warrior did a very, very good route here. You, a few little cute little bonus points. You'll notice that they're not doing any trash with this last boss um, because it's so far removed. You, you'll notice on some of the other bosses, they pull trash with it. This boss is so far removed from any of the action that it would be a very bad idea, especially with the available trash around. So that's just a nice little extra point on the route that they're taking. Also, you'll... Um, something it's not really displayed to you with it being the MDI, but the casters do a good job of telling you and informing you of it. The healers are using the staff from Queen Ashara from the raid, which is a very good staff to use if you can get it as a healer, because it allows you, basically it stores up, you know, whenever you cast a spell, a, a heal, whatever, it stores up basically some damage in this weapon. And when you go below 10% mana, it'll burst this damage out um, on, on a target. So it's a very good weapon to have, um, especially if you have good mana control, if you know your group, if you if you know you're gonna be able to use this and, and you know there are gonna be specific parts of the dungeon where you're gonna get good use of this burst damage, which can just be very, very helpful as a healer. Um, but that's really kind of the round off there. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you'll be looking forward to future videos. Our next challenge will be looking at each of the specific dungeons in the game and we'll kind of be working through, you know, things we haven't touched on. Well, which groups are scary? You know, what mob do I want to avoid? What mob needs interrupting and succeeding? And, and, you know, what's a priority kill order? What route should I take? We're going to be going through all of that in the series that follows. We'll get everyone on the basic page before we even look at any affixes and scare you with all those spooky things. But I hope, hope you've enjoyed this video and uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care.